Oh, fantastic. Hey, just remain standing for a moment and a big welcome to everybody in Rotterdam and Brussels. Good to have you with us today. We have Mel Fletcher with us and uh, many of you will know Mel. He's, he's a favourite of our church. Every year we, we invite Mel to come. Every year he comes. We were talking about it just last night. It's like having an uncle come to church, come, come back and share his wisdom and uh, he's been part of the, our, our church family, I guess, Talking Hillsong Church for a long, long time. But it's absolutely incredible what, what is achieved when it comes to really sucking the marrow out of life. He started a youth ministry in Australia, which became the largest youth ministry in Australia. I've just heard recently that his legacy, the, the fruit of that, there's been over 137,000 people have made decisions at youth live events, which is what Mal actually started and grew and grew to become, to become what it is. It's absolutely phenomenal. So as a minister of the gospel, absolutely incredible, but so much more over the last period of time where he's been in Europe and really pioneering the way when it comes to seeing Christians in the world, bringing a Christian worldview, bringing the solutions of God to society, bringing the wisdom of God to society. And, and I think for me, one of the key things that really shows the impact that he's been having is the fact that the BBC, one of the world's leading media organizations, when stuff goes on, they call him to hear his view as a commentator on what's going on in the world. And he brings a Christian worldview to it. He brings wisdom, the wisdom of God into situations. And so to have him as, uh, for, for me, to have him part of our church family and to speak in to the life of our church every year is just such an honor and a privilege. Can we welcome Mal as he comes to share the word? Good morning, church. Good morning, church. You can sit down. Thank you. Thank you to the band. Let's give them a hand as we do. It's good to be here this morning. It's good to be anywhere physically this morning, isn't it? Out of habit, I almost came to church today in my pajamas. You should be very thankful that I remembered in time that this is real church. I have a long association with Amsterdam. I think the first time I ever spoke here was in 1994. And uh, in fact, the largest venue I've ever spoken in anywhere in the world is your Olympic Stadium. So I have a, a lot of great memories of great things God has done in Amsterdam and a lot of respect for the history too of this great city and your great nation. But it's great to be in church today and welcome to everybody who's watching in Rotterdam and in Brussels, hope you have a great morning. And to anybody watching online, good to have you here too. We're not going to sell you anything. We just want to share with you some principles of the Word of God that will help you live a great life. Lord, we just thank you this morning. Once again, we remind ourselves that we are, in essence, just creatures of dust created by your hand. Created for great and noble purposes, to achieve great things, but we know we also fell from that position of grace when we sought our own way without reference to you. And thank God you sent your son Jesus to die for us, to restore us to a position of proper alignment with the will of God for us and the purposes of God for us. We pray this morning that you'll help this messenger. He is tired and he needs your grace, so we pray you'll help him just to deliver the word of God as you would have it delivered. But we want to hear from you this morning. We don't want the words of just a human being. We want a word from the Holy Spirit of God to us. We pray all that in Jesus' great name. Amen. Amen. This is a problem that Paul never experienced, the tablet. 
In Romans chapter 5, verse 3, Paul says, We also triumph or exalt or celebrate in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance. Perseverance brings about proven character. Proven character brings hope, and hope does not disappoint. Another version says, This hope will not disappoint. Because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. In Jeremiah 29, 11, a verse that many Christians know well, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. To be exiled from one's normal life can be a terrible thing. In recent times, we've come to appreciate again the heartbreaking power of exile, the terrifying pain of people who are forced to leave jobs, homes, even families to escape existential threats. Suddenly, all that is familiar to them is mercilessly stripped away, leaving them grappling desperately for a sense of direction and hope. And on a different level, exile is a word that also describes how many people have felt during the COVID-19 pandemic. While it's been nowhere near as dehumanizing as the alienation thousands of Afghanis have experienced, the feelings of hopelessness, in some cases despair, have seemed very real. And those same feelings were very real to God's people Israel in the Old Testament. Having been invaded by the mighty Babylonian Empire, the best and brightest of the country were taken captivity into a foreign land. And at the height of their hopelessness, the word of God came to them through the prophet Jeremiah. My plans are to give you a future and a hope. God is essentially saying, I still have plans. The plans I have and announced to you, I still have them. They're plans to give you a future and a hope. And you can have a future without a hope. I used to wonder, why, did, why does this verse mention hope and future separately? Why are they not the synonymous with each other? You can have a future without a hope. But God wants us to have a future that is worthy of our highest expectations, that is worthy of anticipation, that is, in the words of Paul, a hope that does not disappoint. Through the centuries, these words of Jeremiah and Paul echo to us like a clarion call, reminding us that in troubled times like ours, we too can experience a hope that does not disappoint. Now, there is a lot of talk about hope today, but much of it passes that passes for hope is actually nothing more than hype. And I think there's a very big difference between hope and hype, and the world needs hope today more than hype. In the Netherlands, studies show that COVID had a significant impact on mental health, on fear levels, on levels of coping skills. In the first half of this year, 15% of residents of the Netherlands aged 12 or older were struggling with their mental health the highest percentage since health records began back in 2001. Four in ten young adults in this country reported this year feeling gloomier than they felt before the crisis. In one survey, half of Dutch residents said they have trouble sleeping. They also suffer from anxiety, depression, panic and other sorts of attack. Hope was in short supply even before COVID-19. In the UK where I live, one in four people before COVID suffered from irrational fears. And as a, a futurist, I'm a minister too, but I'm a futurist in my world-facing life. I know that when it comes to the future, people need hope as much as or more than they need knowledge. It's all right to have some idea of where the future might be moving, and that's part of my job in terms of technology and social ethics and more. But what people need most of all when it comes to the future is hope. So the question I have this morning is, where do I find this hope that does not disappoint? How do I align my life with it so that I get its benefits? And perhaps more importantly, how do I become a model for this hope in a world that is desperately in need? Of its medicine. Well, the first thing we need to do, and I want to make this as practical as I can in the time I have, we need to understand the basis of Christian hope. It's not based on any future event. It's not based on the future of politics or economics or climate change or technology. All of that's important. But Christian hope is based on an historical event. 
It points backward and then points us forward. Even the greatest Christian critic or critic of Christianity has to admit, I think, that something unprecedented, something extraordinary happened or was perceived to have happened on the first Easter Sunday in AD 29 or thereabouts. If we approach history objectively, we see that there's more extant documentary evidence for the resurrection of Christ than for the existence of Julius Caesar and a score of other historical figures whose existence nobody very much ever questions. In other words, there's more written evidence written close to the time of the event for the resurrection of Jesus than there is for the existence of Caesar and a great many other historical figures. But nobody ever questions their existence. In the Gospels, you see, the resurrection is not presented as some vague philosophical idea, some metaphor for reality. In the Gospels, it's presented as an incontrovertible but incomprehensible historical fact. Even as the writers of the New Testament didn't quite know how it happened. They just knew that it did. It was an unfamiliar event. The idea of this kind of resurrection was not part of the philosophical or theological tradition of the ancient writers. In the ancient world, there were some people who believed in a spiritual resurrection after death. There were others who believed that there might be a physical resurrection on the day of reckoning. But nobody, but nobody, but nobody in the ancient world talked about the spontaneous raising from the dead of a single individual just a short while after he or she had died. And this was such an unfamiliar event, ladies and gentlemen, that when the apostles began preaching it in the book of Acts, they needed miracles to back it up. It was a physical event. In the Gospels, this is not some mass hallucinogenic experience, some kind of Jewish Woodstock where everybody got high and had a mass hallucination. By the way, psychologists will tell you that hallucinations don't happen en masse. Jesus appeared with a physical body. He said, touch me and see that it is I. Put your hand in the wounds. Put your hand in the side. This is me. Give me something to eat. Let me eat with you. Now, it was a modified body. And if you've ever been into cars, you know the transformation that happens if you try to put a Corvette engine in a Volkswagen. That's what Jesus' body was like after the resurrection. It had unusual properties. It seems that it could appear when the doors were locked. It could appear and disappear at will. Perhaps it's suggested in the New Testament that it took on different visage, different appearance at times, slightly different, so that even his disciples didn't recognize him immediately. On the road to Emmaus, two men are walking with him on the road and don't even recognize him until he breaks bread and prays over it. Mary thought he was the gardener in the garden. Oh, that's because he was dark. Well, maybe it was, but there's plenty of evidence that people didn't always recognize Jesus when he first appeared to them. It was a dramatic event. It gave the apostles hope that the great adventure they'd set out on three years before with Jesus was still a viable deal. That this thing was still worth pursuing. Maybe you're listening or watching this right now and you feel after COVID-19 that much of what you're doing is not viable anymore. You don't see the point in much of what you've been doing. You don't see the point in coming to church, for example. More important perhaps than that, you don't see the point of following the call of God on your life. Whether it's in the marketplace, in business or media or education or law, whatever it is. Listen, it's still a viable concern. No pandemic can take that away from you. That's the hope you have because of the resurrection. Christian hope isn't, again, based in the future state of politics. It doesn't matter who's in power now when it comes to this hope. It's nothing to do with the future of the European economy or the Netherlands economy. It's nothing to do with, tech, with the, the impact of global warming, though that is a vital issue for us to be involved in. It's all about something that's already happened 2,000 years ago, ladies and gentlemen. And because of that hope, it points us not just to our history, but to our ultimate destiny. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, it says, One day we shall be like him, for we shall see him just as he is. In Romans 8, 23, it says, We await the full adoption, the redemption of our bodies. Your spirit, if you're a Christian, is redeemed now. 